Hi, I'm Tim. Welcome to Watchbox and thanks for logging on. If you're not watching this on the new Watchbox app, you're doing it all wrong. New features available on the Apple App Store or Google Play. You'll see Watchbox Studios content one week early, exclusive on the app. Plus, you can read editorial content from our own Jack Foster and your favorite third party watch journals, magazines, and blogs. Also, shop our inventory, browse 3,000 pre owned and vintage luxury watches while also storing your collection, including details of condition, box, and papers. Finally, stay in touch with me, my team, and our entire family of Watchbox client advisors around the world. I'm Tim, and I'll see you on the app. Hi, I'm Tim. Welcome to Watchbox, and thanks for logging on. Great stories make great watch collections. Tales of good times today in abundance, thanks to Craig. Craig, welcome to the show. Tim, thanks for having me. I'm thrilled to be here. This is a lot of fun because you've got everything from Swatch up to Rolex complications and everything in between. But you sort of came to watch collecting later in life than most, around 2015. How did you get there, and what changed from your earlier life? Well, I think, you know, I had always been into cars and I always had a mechanical appreciation and appreciation for engines. And when I got into watches, you know, I see these as little tiny motors and I really appreciate the, the engineering that goes into each of these uh, watches. Now, you always had like one good watch, but at some point you decided maybe due to exposure to the internet or mm -hmm. friends or clubs that you wanted to start building out a portfolio of them. So how did you start? That's a great question. So I was living in Florida uh, in the late 2015-2016 time frame and made a few uh, connections down there. And uh, really, I just saw uh, between seeing what was available at the different stores, and I think that was probably around the time I started watching your videos too, uh, the learning curve was really steep. And I started really having an idea of what, what I liked. Uh, and it all centered around being close to the water. And one of the themes throughout my collection is predominantly a lot of my watches are watches that you can swim with. Because when you're in Florida, you know you're never far from a beach or a pool or something like that. I think it's good to talk philosophically about how you build up your collection because you are a very thoughtful collector. Your watches mm -hmm. are varied, but they do fit themes. Um, let's talk about the idea of Watches being big, I think mm -hmm. blue, and very water resistant and yeah. busy. You and also busy. like busy watches. Yeah, I, I, the, the, one of the themes that goes through my collection is the dials. Uh, a lot of people see busy dials as a detraction. Uh, I actually like them. I think it keeps me interested. There's always something different to look at when I'm looking at the dials. Uh, sometimes, you know, my older eyes aren't what they used to be, so now they're a little bit harder to look at. Um, but there's always something interesting to see, uh, especially on something like uh, the World Times. And it's interesting to see someone who takes this maximalist approach because it seems like, you know, simple watches are very chic these days. You've got an oyster perpetual in there, but it's your wife's watch. <laughs> That's right. She let me bring it along today. Your watch is like this train master diver world time, a lot more, let's say, intricate. You've got watches as complex as the Yachtmaster 2, mm -hmm. but you can also find that complexity at lower price points in your collection. Exactly. And the thing about for that, well, that watch, for example, um, the bang for the buck is amazing. The bracelet, I mean, it's like a bank vault. You've got the diving capability on it if you want to take it in the water. And if you travel, you've got the world time function. So I think it's a great all around watch. I, I purchased the first generation, loved it. And when they came out with the smaller size, the generation two, um, I thought I might as well pick it up because it was in blue and I, I thought it was a nice color. And it's interesting to me that you started in collecting back when you could still walk into a Rolex dealer and get a Rolex out of the case. And yet, pretty quickly, you gravitated towards Ball and you've got three of them yeah. with the Roadmaster Pilot GMT in mm -hmm. there, uh, two different Trainmaster Diver World Timers. 
I know how people discover Rolex. I don't know how they discover Ball. How did you come to the brand? I think, uh, you know, having my roots in Pennsylvania and being a, a bit of a, a train aficionado, you've heard the name Ball, and, and visiting, uh, visiting the National Watch Museum in Columbia, PA, there are also some Ball watches that are featured prominently there as well. Uh, and then just doing a little research on the internet, um, it was a brand that wasn't really featured all that heavily, but when you take a look at what they have to offer, I think, I think they create a, a great value proposition. And it is interesting that you mention as a Pennsylvania loco, you've, you've had that exposure to both horology through the National Watch and Clock Museum, mm -hmm. traditional watchmaking in Lancaster, but then also trains, which are like a mania in this state. <laughs> That's right. There's a hell of a museum out in Scranton if you want to learn more. Um, so, okay, take me back now to 2015-16, mm -hmm. and you're looking at Rolex in the mm -hmm. case yeah. itself, you know, a scarce site these days. Uh, but what grabbed you first? Because I don't think you're a typical start with a Submariner kind of guy. No. Um, you know, I do have bigger wrists, and the Submariner fits okay. But doing some research, you know, going down that, that rabbit hole, if you will, the, the one that really uh, knocked my socks off was the Deep Sea. And that one, when I saw it, when you take a look at the engineering capability that goes into that watch, um, but also... I mean, the gradient of the dial, it's just, it, it's a striking watch. And that's the Deep Blue model. Uh, yes, yes, the, deep, the James Cameron edition, correct. Um, and that one, that was really when my, my start of collecting, if you will, really started. Now, to go a little bit further with your philosophy, mm -hmm. I know you like to, you buy what catches your attention. Mm -hmm. You don't believe watches should be investments. No. Tell me a little bit about what you mean when you say a watch is not an investment, because you said this, but unpack it. I, I think a lot of times people get too focused on looking at, well, what am I going to be able to sell this watch for if I buy it? And I think that takes away from a lot of the enjoyment. These are, I mean, at the end of the day, this is jewelry and this is something that should be enjoyed. It should be worn. It should be knocked around. Um, and, and I think, especially on the internet nowadays, people talk too much about watches as investments. And I think ask anybody that has sold something other than a Rolex, an AP, or a Patek over the last couple of years, and they'll tell you, uh, watch collecting is not an investment. It's a labor of love, and you should buy these because you love them. And I think you really do because, you know, I think if I'm going to buy a Rolex to make money or hold value, it's probably not going to be a full yellow gold bracelet Yamaster 2 or probably a Sky not. Dweller. Probably no. not. <laughs> but you bought them because they're fun and yes. because, frankly, I think bigger, bolder watches are very much in your wheelhouse. They are. Um, and again, I like conversation pieces. And I think they're a couple of watches that you really don't see every day. And when you come across uh, a casual collector or someone just getting into the hobby, these, these are things that can really catch people's eyes. I'm curious, have you found occasions to use the Yachtmaster 2 complication? I have not used it yet. So, uh, and the... Uh, you know, the deep sea has gone as deep as the bottom of my pool. So it, these really don't get used for their intended purposes, but I can still enjoy them immensely. Yeah, without a doubt. And I think it's important to remember that, you know, great collections are collections that have great stories associated with them. Yeah. And a lot of these watches have traveled. We'll get into that in just mm -hmm. a minute, but I want to ask you another question. You told me the other half of your collecting philosophy is that when giving advice, you tell people to buy their second watch first. What does that That's right. mean? So what I mean by that is, you know, I think a lot of times people uh, starting out in watch collecting, they have their eye on a certain model and maybe they can't get it or they can't afford it or something like that. And they, they settle for something else. They buy something in lieu of what they really want. Um, and then in, in just like every other hobby, you know, that learning curve is fairly steep. And after a while, they realize that that's not the watch they really wanted and, and they're stuck with it. And that's why I say, if it's something you really want, hold, save up for it, um, look for, if it's something you can't get at an authorized dealer, uh, go to someone like Watchbox that will have an extensive inventory of watch, uh, watches that you want and work with them to find something that's going to make you happy. On the assumption that if you think that first watch is going to be a compromise watch yeah. and that you're going to work your way up to the watch you really wanted, you're really going to wind up buying two watches and spending more. Two watches and you're probably going to leave one in the, in, in the box that you're not going to wear all that much. 
So you jumped from cars to watches around 2015, 2016, and really your description of these being little motors is probably the most succinct statement I've ever heard explaining why watch and car guys have so much crossover. You had a health scare in 2018, and you reconsidered your collection, but also your lifestyle. Tell me about that. Correct. Uh, I was living in Florida at the time, had a melanoma scare, and uh, just really took stock of everything at the time and realized um, one of the things I wanted to do was, was to start traveling and just came upon it randomly and uh, booked a trip to Austria, Switzerland, and really fell in love with that part of the world and ended up, uh, now it's a, a regular trip that uh, my wife and I take uh, once a year to Switzerland, and then we'll take another trip um, once a year to Austria and uh, Northern Italy as well. So it's, it's really become uh, a, way, a way for us to make memories. And uh, we, we also you know, find a watch if there's one offered wherever we go to kind of re have as a reminder of our trip. So let's work away from some of the watches over here to uh, some of the watches over here. Yeah. Starting with the Sky Dweller, you showed me a picture. I think you had that one on the Stelvio Pass. Stelvio Pass, uh, which is where, the, if you've watched the show Top Gear a couple of years ago, they, the hosts named it the uh, best driving road in the world. And my wife and I were there. It was actually about a week and a half ago. And uh, it, it's a, a beautiful area where Switzerland, Austria, and Italy kind of intersect. And uh, just, just a, uh, when the weather's nice, it's a beautiful place to be. So that's the Italian Dolomites. Yes. And that's the transition from border to border. Correct. And so you actually traveled with your Sky Dweller GMT. You used it you as a travel watch. I did, actually, yes. I had the chance to use it. And actually, it came in very handy um, checking back here uh, and, and being able to, to see the local time. So, you know, your, your dive watch has been down to the bottom of the pool, but you've yeah. legitimately traveled with the I, Sky Dweller. I have, yes. So tell me a little bit about these local editions mm -hmm. that you buy, because these yeah. Swatch does local boutique editions, and you kind of mark the miles by picking them up. Correct. So what we do is when we uh, when we go to different locations, we'll we'll find a watch that's offered in the local Swatch boutique, uh, and they're not offered everywhere. But uh, a lot of, a lot of the places that we have gone, we've been lucky enough to find these different uh, versions. So Geneva, Zermatt, Bergenstock, Lucerne. And uh, the Louvre, for example, and it's nice because it's a little uh, a little memory of our trip. Beats you know beats the heck out of a refrigerator magnet. True, uh, more fun too. More fun, absolutely. So now the Geneva piece is really interesting because it's got this sort of uh, like international post packaging. You got the little jet d'eau right there. Yeah. Then you open it up. You you know you pull out the interior, and. I actually got this watch from my mom a few years ago because I sort of do the same thing. I mark mm -hmm. the miles and I get her the watch yeah. for each locality. Do you, do you frame them up? Do you put them in a case? Do you wear them? Well, we don't actually. We just, we just keep them as our little collection and we pull them out a couple of times a year and just think about uh, how much fun we had in each of the locations. Um, one of the ones that we have, though, it's, it's a smaller model that Swatch made a few years ago and it had the crests of each of the different cantons of Switzerland on it. And we actually have the maxi swatch version of that hanging in our, uh, our foyer. And uh, it's nice because my wife's parents live in another country. So we actually have two maxi swatches, one set to local time, one set to their local time. So these are very cool keepsakes and I get it. They're city specific. Yep. I, you gotta tell me about the story behind the bunny sutra and the pug. <laughs> so uh, our pug, he is, he is our boy. And uh, when I found out Swatch made a pug watch, uh, he, if you have a pug, you know you collect every, our role is no pug left behind. So if we go into a store and we, we see a pug salt shaker or, or ornament for the wall or something like that, we bring it home. So when I found out there was a pug Swatch, uh, we had to get it. As a pug guy can understand, we turn our houses into shrines Absolutely. for them. I don't know if golden retriever people obsessively <laughs> buy golden retriever gear, but pug guys are into it. 100%. Okay, Bunny Sutra. I don't know if we can actually show you guys a picture of this watch, so use your imagination, but where did this come from? So this was an interesting piece. I didn't even know Swatch made it. Uh, and when I saw that they did, again, getting back to that whole conversation piece uh, um, mentality, uh, this is, this is something that, that does not come about every day. And, and 
even people in the watch community don't know that something like this exists. Um, but there is one in the Swatch Museum in BLBN, actually. So uh, pretty cool watch. Uh, it does a few things that uh, on the dial that, you know. This is a family show. I don't know if yeah. we can go too deep into yep. that. Yep. But uh, yeah, this is a legend, though. Bunny Sutra, it's, it's up there. Uh, along with your like 1993 Royal Oak Offshore, it's one of those like before you die type watches you've got to own. Absolutely. Now talking about conversation pieces, you've got two Breitling emergencies, including the only one I've ever seen full gold on a bracelet. How'd you wind up with duplicates? So I, I bought the titanium uh, watch first and I, I just thought, again, a conversation piece because it, it, it was funny, I had a couple of clients we were having lunch and we were just talking about watches and they said randomly, have you ever seen one of those watches where you, you can unscrew it and pull the antenna out? And lo and behold, I was actually wearing that watch that day. And uh, so it's a watch that people actually know exists and I'm not exactly sure how because it's a fairly, I would call it a kind of an arcane model. Um, and then when I, I, I didn't even know that the full gold version existed and too much time on my hands one Saturday morning, I actually saw a picture of it on the internet, uh, did some searching and it turned out that uh, there was one available in the Dubai store. And uh, Joshua was kind enough uh, after some communication to uh, ship it over and it became part of my collection. That is the first that I have ever seen. and. I would say having one as a conversation piece, yeah. having two means you may own the largest portfolio of emergencies in the world. It just might be, yes. So now you've got a lot of different watches and you spread the love. Uh, you've got Rolex, mm -hmm. you've got Carl F. Bucher, you've got Longines. The Longines is different from most of your watches in that you've set a standard of highly water resistant mm -hmm. watches. Correct. But that is actually a dress watch, a quadruple retrograde where to come from? So the Longines, uh, my wife and I were vacationing in, in Switzerland and in the hotel we were staying at, they actually had a Longines store and I saw that uh, at the store and just fell in love with it. Again, uh, being a quadruple retrograde watch, busy dial yes, and a lot going on there. And the fact that it's an annual calendar, it's a GMT, it's a moon phase, day of the week, uh, it, it just, it checked all the boxes for me. and. Again, the other theme of my collection is you can get a lot uh, for a little bit of money. There, are, There's an, an impressive value there with this Longines. And uh, it's, it's a great watch, fixed, fits under a dress cuff, so I can wear it at work. Um, very presentable, even if it's not uh, swimmable. Yeah, it's a, it's a very cool watch. It is definitely big and busy. It's not blue. Yes, not blue. But the hands might be blue, but that's about it. <laughs> Speaking of big and busy, <laughs> I guess your Audemars Piguet, Jules Audemars equation of time and sunset yeah. and sunrise is, is even busier still. Uh, even busy, and I don't know if I should take these out or Oh, go or for not, it, go for it, yeah. talking about them. But the thing about this, and this is one that I actually, when you, uh, I saw one of your reviews on this watch a few years ago, and it just blew my mind because aside from the equation of time, uh, this gives you the sunrise and the sunset at a certain location. This one just happens to be Mexico. Um, the, there are other companies out there that make equations of time. So Panerai makes an equation of time. Vacheron makes an equation of time. But I don't know any other watch manufacturer that makes an actual sunrise sunset. I'm sure there, there are. But the uniqueness of this watch in such a small package, uh, really, it, it was something that I had to have. It is interesting to me, some people, like my, my friend, my good friend got married in a place called Roofless Church, very minimalist. Mm -hmm. uh, your philosophy of watch collection is less Roofless Church and more like Sagrada Familia. It would be, yes. Uh, or the Duomo in Milan or something like that. Absolutely, yes. Now you're trying to the case back as well, because this mm -hmm. is one of your few display case back watches. It is. Um, just the, the movement in here it, it is a work of art. The uh, rotor is hand engraved. It's got wording on it that I'm sure that Garrett will be able to pull up. Um, but it is, it, is, it is just the, the amount of man hours that go into putting something like this together. And this is, this is not a current watch. This is going back, what, 16 years. I think this is about 2007 vintage. Um, a lot of work goes into a watch like this. Um, and I was actually lucky enough to wear this to the Audemars Piguet Museum 
when I was there in February, and they actually have an identical copy in the museum. So I've got a couple of wrist shots of this with the one in the case, uh, with this also with the, uh, um, with the Universelle also, which is the centerpiece of that museum. So that sort of opens the door to an interest in Audemars Piguet and a trip to yeah. the Vallée de Joux. Yeah. Talk a little bit about watch vacationing with mm -hmm. a buddy, because this just happened, and actually it was one of our previous collector conversations. Archie was with you. Yeah, it was so funny. Um, you know, we're, we're part of, of your uh, watch group on Facebook, and he had posted something, uh, and I saw where he was posting from, and it just turned out that I was going to be uh, in Switzerland the following week, and uh, we had never met. We had never even, even uh, corresponded back and forth, but uh, we ended up meeting, and uh, grabbing lunch, walking around uh, the city of Geneva, going to a couple of watch museums and things like that. And uh, I was, uh, he, his hospitality was, was tremendous and I was lucky enough to show him that hospitality when he came over to America a few months ago, so. And that's fantastic because this is how the watches become more memorable. You associate yeah. them with people and places. Absolutely. It's the whole notion that you're gonna enjoy your watch more if it's an experience versus a purchase and also it's a lot more fun to have a buddy with you. That's right. So let me know then, since you are like a very buddy-oriented watch collector, do you influence your friends? Do they influence you, or is it a little bit of both? It's a little bit of both. Um, there are there are some watches that I can, uh, I, you, you always appreciate what goes into making a watch, and you always appreciate it for what it is, but it might not have a place in your collection. Doesn't mean it's a bad watch, it's just not right for you. And I feel that way about my watches. They're not gonna be right for everybody either, but I'm sure people can appreciate them. And that's part of it, and it's part of uh, sharing the knowledge and just sharing the enthusiasm of, uh, of this hobby that we have. And also, you mentioned that you know, a watch is not an investment mm -hmm. in the same sense that a vacation is not an investment. A Correct. purebred dog is not an investment. A year of fine dinners at a restaurant is not an investment. But you definitely get your money's worth on these trips you take. Absolutely. Uh, and I will say a purebred dog is probably more of a liability than an yeah, investment. Well, we both had pugs. <laughs> we know that. <laughs> um, but yes, the, uh, you know, the, memories, the memories that go into these, the, at the end of the day, that's all you have. And uh, it's nice to be able to, to, to share that. And what factories were you able to visit? I know you saw Omega, you saw so AP. So we saw the, uh, the Omega, the AP museums, the, uh, 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 the Swatch Museum. Uh, and I was also able to get a factory tour of uh, Carl F. Bucher as how, well. How much advance like, notice did they need to let you in? Uh, um, a few months. It was, it was something where you work, you work through your representative and they can pull a few strings and then you just line up your, uh, you know, line up your travel itinerary and, and make it work. Speaking of Carl F. Bucher, you gotta watch over there. It's big, it's, it's blue, it's water resistant. Why did that one join the collection? Where has it been with you? So I, I, I don't know if I could consider this my extra Rolex now after the news. Oh, right, but, yeah, I forgot. Um, House brand. But it is, uh, the thing that attracted me to this, first of all, it is a big, chunky watch. The dimensions are very similar to the Rolex Deep Sea. Um, but I, I just love the blue dial on this. I just thought it was striking. And this watch gets more comments about the color blue than anything. Uh, it's a go-anywhere watch. It's been with me all over the world a few times on a number of trips and the places I stay have pools and things like that so it's nice to you know I'll be out hiking or sightseeing or something like that come home change jump in the pool and and uh, this will be right there with me and that's a watch that's been with you through Italy yeah. Switzerland Austria absolutely when you went to Carl F. Bucher did you I this was on my wrist absolutely so I represented and they appreciated it and you know it's interesting you mentioned people compliment the dial because I find you know, I could wear a Patek Philippe 5016 around. To me, that watch is the end of the world. Mm -hmm. But non-watch people don't care. No. Sometimes you wear watches that are a little bit different like that, or the Devon Tread in my case, and all of a sudden people start asking questions. Absolutely. There's compliments. It brings the non-watch person into our world. Again, and that gets back to one of my themes, which I think is um, conversation pieces. Yeah. Okay, conversation pieces indeed. You've got a very unconventional mundane over here. Mm -hmm. And anyone who's traveled by Swiss Railroad would probably be able to relate, but tell me the tale here. So the coolest thing about that, well, when you go to Switzerland, uh, all of the train stations, uh, all of the clocks are interconnected. And the way they work is the second hand sweeps on a 58 second uh, sweep, and then it stops for two seconds to move the minute hand. 
And this was, and you can check, if you look at YouTube videos, you'll be able to see it. And this little watch uh, actually replicates that movement. And I don't know how they do it. It's just a quartz movement. It's not an expensive watch, but this is, an ide this is identical to the watches in the Swiss train stations. And it's actually branded um, with, the Swiss, uh, with the Swiss train uh, brand on there. But it'll stop when it comes to the top of the minute. And uh, what happens is it'll stop for two seconds and then the minute hand will pop over and uh, then it will continue its journey. So, oh, that is a goes. riot. Yeah, S -bay -bay. Yeah. That, that is very, very cool. It's got a so, lovely vented multicolor strap. I put an aftermarket strap on it. Uh, again, better for the pool, but that, that's one that every time I look at it, I just smile. I find myself you know, waiting until the top of the minute, just until it does its thing. Uh, and it, it just reminds me of my trips and, and makes me happy. Now, some of the watches you buy are watches that seem to remind you of uh, memorable travels. Mm -hmm. You've got the Tissot T-Touch, and it's a smart watch, but it's uh, the Jungfrau. Correct. Smart watch, not an expensive watch, but the Jungfrau is a, a train uh, station. It's actually um, a train line that goes through the Eiger, the Monk, and the Jungfrau Mountains. Uh, and it's above Grindelwald, Switzerland, and they made this commemorative watch. So if you go to that valley, you'll see this version on some of the advertising with the yellow secondhand, the blue bezel. That specific one is the Jungfrau edition, and that's what this is. That's kind of cool, because you did send me the picture for Monday Mailbag on my Monday mm -hmm. show of you wearing your green sub in Grindelwald. Yes. Now, do you go for the skiing, for the spas? What is it that draws you to the mountains in that region? You know, I just like being in that area. I haven't skied for 30 years, and, and I, Switzerland is not the place to start. I don't want to be <laughs> helicoptered out. So what I found is, you know, I, I take my phone and I take my drone. I get up early. I, I take some drone videos, take a few pictures, um, take some wrist shots, and then it's it's you know, back to the hotel by the mid-afternoon and head to the pool before dinner. Yeah, cars and drones and watches. You're really serious with this motor of scale ah, type thing. Pretty much, yeah. Um, so now you've got one watch in here that's very different from the others because mm -hmm. it is no holds barred vintage and you're not a vintage collector. Tell me a little bit about your Red Submariner and why that's special to you. So I'm not generally a vintage collector, but this one, uh, I got the call one day and this is pretty much my birth watch. And it is a uh, red Submariner. So I believe the uh, red lettering was only made for three or four years. Uh, this is the Mark IV dial, which I think is the best dial. It's, it's, the patina is starting to come through on it. It's actually changed since I've owned it. Um, but what's neat about it is it has the open sixes on the dial, which match the open numbers on the date wheel. So pretty interesting vintage watch, I think. Yeah, and I think one of only two red Submariners that has the distinctive red on white print. Yes. I think it's the two and the yeah. four that have that. And that apparently is the way they did it. They would print everything on the dial in white first, and then they'd come in with red and stamp it. So sometimes it was a little bit off. You can see the uh, white underneath on certain ones. It's interesting to me that you chose the sub as your mm -hmm. birth year watch. Was it yeah. just that that was the best example of a birth year Rolex, or did you have your heart set on a sub? Didn't really have my heart. I mean, I, I've got the subs, the GMTs, the Daytonas, so it wasn't like I needed to add. I wasn't like I was looking for another one, um, but the fact that I had a connection to that year, the year it was made, um, and it, it did come with punched papers, so it has proper documentation and everything. Uh, I just thought I might, I might as well go for it. Now, what's interesting to me is that you started early with Rolex, and then it seems like you progressed to Tudor, and it's supposed to work the other way. So how did you get into around. Tudor? Um, and, you know, one of the things is when you do your research on this, you find out the Tudor, uh, again, uh, offers a lot of bang for the buck. So the Pelagos that you have there, amazing watch. The Loom is incredible. I can wear it wherever I go. Um, and every bit, pound for pound, uh, will stand up with a Submariner. You know, I like that. And you get some features here that even the sub's not going to give you. Like, for one thing, a 500-meter diving. For another, helium escape valve. Yes. And a really cool clasp with an extensible bit that's unlike any Rolex. Unlike any Rolex, you've got the spring clasp on there where if you needed to put it around a, a diving suit or something like that, you could. But it's very convenient in the afternoon when your wrist gets a little bigger, when you swell up, um, you can change it very easily and adjust it. You've also got the, well, let's call it the 
quasi Pan Am GMT, because technically the Pan Am GMT executive dial was a Rolex, but that's okay. Tudor's <laughs> like the modern day homage to Rolex's history. I, I don't have the funds to be able to, to purchase that, uh, that white dial Rolex GMT, but this, again, a tremendous watch. It comes across much better in person than it did in the photos. Uh, and when I saw it, I had to have it. And at the price point, you just can't beat it. Again, uh, being that I love to travel, having the GMT function uh, is very important to me. So it's nice to be able to have that in a watch that I think looks, looks great. So fun stuff here. And what I really find cool is that you've got two Pepsi GMTs mm -hmm. just here, and neither one of them is actually a Rolex. <laughs> Correct. Um, you know, it's just one of those things where I, I, I just like the way they look. I uh, love the features. That's the one where you can adjust... Um, you can adjust the GMT. It's got the quarter turns, uh, kind of like that Patek does. Yeah, like a 5524. Right, exactly, where you can you can turn it, unlock it, and, and you can adjust it. Yeah, so, really nice watch. And tritium, too, on the dial. Tritium dials, um, if, if, uh, if you look at these in the middle of the night, they practically act like night, night lights. That is cool. And it's great to see, like, a little collection of ball, because while it is, you know, a Swiss-made brand, it does mm -hmm. still feel very American. It does, yes. Seiko, this is the odd man out. How'd this happen? So that's, that, that goes back way before 2015. That was a watch I probably got in the early 2000s. Um, I, just, I was living in Pittsburgh at the time, and uh, black and yellow, hey, I wanted to represent for the Steelers. So it was a great, uh, great watch, and it packs a whole lot of functionality. It's got travel time. It's got an alarm. Um, it's, it's got uh, basically the slide rule function on the bezel, and if you could figure that out, um, you're better at math than I am. But it's, it's got a lot packed into a little, uh, a, a little case, and again, it's water resistant. It's fascinating to me because this is the contemporary of your Audemars Piguet. Yeah. A lot of folks write off quartz as disposable watches. If you buy high quality quartz, I mean, it can last a lifetime. You've had a Rolex Oyster quartz that was decades old. The Oyster Quartz I had was, yeah, from the early 80s, and uh, just a tremendous watch. Um, you know, that's got that, that, I think it was the 5035, the, the uh, thermocompensated movement. And uh, the neat thing about that watch is you put it up to your ear, and it just, you could hear it in a quiet room even, you could hear that thing ticking. Because it had a Swiss lever. Yes. E even as a Quartz. Yes, exactly. So, you see, guys, don't give up on Quartz. Quartz can be luxury. You've just got to pick the right Quartz watches. That's right. Do you do smart watches other than the Tissot? Other than the Tissot, no. Um, that, that one I really picked up more as the, the commemoration of the trip, more so than anything. I guess you were on the PRX train early uh -huh. because uh, this is a fantastic piece and actually reminds me of an Oyster Quartz. It really does. The form function is almost identical. It's a little bit slimmer, um, but if you put them right next to each other, they look like brother and sister. That's a few hundred dollars. How did mm -hmm. you encounter this? Was this this wasn't in the Rolex dealer, was it? It was not. I uh, actually purchased that online from Tissot, and uh, had it in about a week. So it was pretty easy. I don't know if that one's still in stock or not. But when my wife wears her uh, tur turquoise op, I can I can wear that, and we'll pretty much match. Now there is one watch that you own other than the red sub, which I'm mm -hmm. going to say actually does have some investment potential. Mm -hmm. Tell me a little bit about your Sea Dweller 46 digit. So this, this was a watch that I think if you, if you take a look at it, it, it really, in my mind, presents as the, the most harmonious dial, the best representation of what a Sea Dweller should be. Earlier models did not have the tick marks all the way around the 60 minute bezel. Um, this one does. Uh, I also like the fact that unlike the Submariner, it does not have the Cyclops, so it makes it a little bit, uh, a little bit more evenly balanced, I think. And it does have the helium escape valve on the side. This is, this is a watch that, Tim, you would know better than I, is made for only three years, I yes. believe, something like that. So one of the very short runs when it comes to modern Rolexes. And uh, the beautiful thing about it is you'll wear this watch and uh, you'll pass a thousand people and none of them will, they'll think you're wearing a Submariner. And it's just a good looking watch. Beautiful looking watch, matte dial. Um, just, just amazing. It's interesting to me that the watches that are oftentimes are failures in their initial run become the most collectible. People back then were saying, oh, it looks like a sub, it costs more than a sub, but it, yep. people think it's a sub, why would I spend extra money on? Now they're like, you know, I wish I had two, one to wear and one for the safe. Very similar to the car hobby, right? Exactly. Yeah. 
What, what kind of car is you into, by the way? Uh, you know, I, it's, it's been a little bit of everything. Um, sorry to say, it's mostly European exotics. So, uh, unlike okay. you, which the, likes we have a lot of Detroit European iron. exotics here. Uh, but, but, I do uh, like Detroit iron. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but I've been through the Ferraris and everything, uh, the Porsches. Uh, lately, as as you get older, it gets into more of the Mercedes, the C C class, and things like that. AMG hardware. Yeah, AMG C sixty three. Um, actually, going to a driving event in a couple weeks. Um, for AMG. It's interesting. AMG cars are relatively subtle as performance machines, but big gold watches are not. I see a sub theme of gold. I, yeah. Is this something that maybe springs from your South Florida or Florida coast years? <laughs> um, it, it may. I just, I, for some reason, I just, I just like like the precious metal. I, I just think it stands out not to be flashy or anything. Uh, I, I just really enjoy the color. It, it gives me, I have a bit of a darker skin tone and I think it looks good on the wrist also. Now, so. It's good to see a collection that's not just like 38 millimeter steel vintage dress watches. This is a lot of fun. <laughs> You're not a dogmatic collector at all. And I, I would say nothing's probably more emblematic of that than this. Tell me a little bit about the Margret and how you found this. So again, I was just looking online, found uh, found that brand. It's a New Zealand brand. Uh, it's a, a bronze watch, and I actually had the bronze Tudor at the time, and I thought this would be a nice uh, uh, a nice thing to kind of mix up with my collection. And uh, I just love the slate dial, the slate bezel, uh, the loom on this is incredible. And uh, the way this watch has patinaed over the five or so years that I've owned it, uh, I think it's, it's, it's come out really, really beautifully. I mean, I find that cool that you're willing to try both uh, a different brand mm -hmm. and a different kind of watch designed by outsiders, yeah. people who are not Swiss, people who are not European. Yeah. Uh, this Magret's a really nice looking mm -hmm. watch and it does have the bronze you imagine when you think of bronze, yeah. whereas like Tudor bronze is almost yellow. This really does look very rich, deep, dark, silted. It has that, it, it's unlike the Tudor, which um, the patina was a little bit uneven and a little lighter. Uh, this comes through as just a dark chocolatey brown. And like you said, it's just what you think of when you think of a bronze piece of anything, really. Yeah, when you talk about the Bronze Age, it's this it's bronze. That. That's correct. So when did you buy this watch? Uh, about five years ago, I think. It's interesting to me that you're, you're sort of a non-linear collector. A mm -hmm. lot of guys start with affordable watches, and then they get to the point where they're like, you know, mortgaging the house and selling kidneys. You you buy watches that, you know, are considerable outlays, but then you go back to watches that cost a thousand or five hundred or a few hundred dollars. Yeah, that's because I've spent so much money on the watch the first time, then I have to go buy the cheap watch. So. Um, but it's really what it comes down to is what I like, um, and and price points, um, I think take a back seat to am I going to wear it? Does it suit my purpose? Uh, and is it going to be enjoyable to look at? And it's going to be fun. So, I guess you've got a pretty comprehensive philosophy of collecting. Do you have any rules about the size of the collection? Watches in, watches out, or when you sell or trade a watch? So I think. You know, as your watch collection grows, you really have to start taking a look at the, if something comes in, something has to go out. And I think this gets back to that whole watches are not an investment philosophy. Don't, don't keep watches around if you're not wearing them and if you're not enjoying them, because there could be something out there that, that, uh, that you could be enjoying. So I've had watches where I've looked at it and you know, I haven't worn it for three months or six months or nine months, and it uh, might be time for that watch to go in place of something else that I like more. Um, the nice thing about collecting watches as opposed to collecting cars is you, you, you don't need a whole building uh, to keep these watches. So you, you tend to amass a lot more of them, but if they're not getting the wrist time and if you're not enjoying them, it might be time to go. That's interesting. You've got a couple of watches from your wife here. You've certainly mm -hmm. got the, the travel watches that yep. are your keepsakes. But you've also got her uh, Patek Philippe 4774 mm -hmm. vintage, and you've got her Oyster Perpetual 36 over there. Mm -hmm. Now these are critically not the kind of watches that a guy would be tempted to like borrow. She, she collects her own watches in her own style. She does. She's got her own collection, and I just brought two of them today. Um, she loves this this OP, and uh, having a smaller wrist, the 36 millimeter just fits her tremendously. And uh, just a very enjoyable watch, very fun. Um, that watch I actually uh, bought from a friend. It was it just had some bad memories, and they wanted to get rid of it. And it's as much, I would think, I would say jewelry as it is a watch. And uh, you, 
you were kind enough to uh, service this watch. It was having um, some problems with its movement when I got it because it's 40 years old. Um, but uh, you sent it back to Patek and they took really good care of it and brought it back to life. A beads of rice bracelet, uh, multi-step closure, prob probably the most interesting knurled hands I've ever seen on yeah. a watch before. Yeah. You know, it's sometimes you guys can appreciate ladies' watches as objet d'art. I know that's definitely the case with Bulgari Serpenti. Mm -hmm. right. it's, ha it's fun to have them around, even if it's not something we would personally wear. Right, exactly. And again, it gets back to the conversation piece. It's not something that you see every day. So what do future directions look like? You're a traveler, and mm -hmm. watches mostly come from abroad as Americans. Are there any, like, watch tourism trips you've got in mind? Not, not, particu not specifically for watch tourism. Um, we're, we're going to head over to Switzerland again in, in the winter. Um, and I may try to line up a factory visit or two while we're over there and maybe a, see a museum. Um, but right now I'm at the state in my collection where I've, you know, I'm, I'm thinking about a few of the new releases that have come out uh, this year that, that look beautiful. Um, but if I, for some reason, uh, I don't get them, I'm perfectly content with the collection the way it sits right now. Okay, tougher question. You had to go neck down to, let's say, one to three watches. Oh, wow. Where, where would you go with this collection? You can bring in watches that are not physically here <laughs> if you want to. <laughs> That's a tough one. So I would say, uh, you know, the Sky Dweller served me very well for my trip, so I think that would have to be my GMT. Um, the Audemars Piguet would have to be my, my dress watch. And uh, just getting back to the James Cameron, that would be my, my uh, have fun in the pool watch. Oh, you so, really knocked that out. Uh, I may have, may have thought about it once or twice before. Craig, thank you so much. This has been an absolute pleasure. <laughs> thank you, Tim.